Okay, in continuing our discussion about families, we're going to continue to focus on some of the uh, ongoing issues uh, focused on current or modern family. Um, again, because America idealizes itself very much as a very capitalist society, uh, with most of our solutions to problems coming from uh, things regarding the free market, this idea that if we just allow capitalism, we allow uh, the market to operate without any kind of uh, hindrance, uh, it will solve itself. Okay? And, that, and that's where we, we come up with a lot of uh, you know, the ideas about how to address issues. Um, unfortunately, what we don't, again, as we talked about in the previous lecture, uh, we talk about this idea that many of the uh, idealized version of families comes from a very highly subsidized uh, version of the American family that you know the, the American family especially the white suburban you know idealized golden age 1950s television family benefited quite a bit uh, from government assistance um, but then again when we think about the, the role that uh, you know, uh, capitalism plays in the uh, idea of government regulations is to oppose them okay and that we've definitely known that the opposition of government regulations makes it very easy for the economy to change very rapidly without any kind of protections uh, for families themselves. So we've seen, you know, that when things like the economy fluctuates, moves up and down, employment rates change, uh, you know, even like we said, you know, we talked about the, uh, the depression of the early 2000s, you know, the housing market rapidly changes um, and there's no protections built into the system to protect families in particular, then it's usually families who, uh, especially lower class, they have, which uh, suffer the most. Um, so we definitely know uh, that families are often uh, very much at the kind of whim of the economy rather than you know, having a stable place in our society uh, with government regulation in place to protect them. Um, again, this is, this is not we don't see this around the world. You know, in many other countries around the world, many other industrialized nations, um, you know, people who lose their job are entitled to, in a lot of cases, kind of uh, permanent or ongoing access to unemployment benefits, which if you've ever applied for unemployment in our society, can sometimes be very difficult and as well as uh, with a lot of restrictions and a certain amount of stigma, shame attached to it. Um, other nations around the world, um, you know, uh, guarantee health or child care, not only while parents are employed, but if they're unemployed and looking for employment. A lot of times people's child care, is, if they do have it, is associated either with A, their ability to pay, or B, it's associated with their job. So if they lose their job, they no longer have health care, which makes it very difficult then to pursue other types of work. Um, and again, sometimes we even talk about this, like, kind of this concept of, you know, maternity or parental leave, you know, not just for necessarily the parent who is having the child, which is obviously, you know, uh, biologically uh, females, but also, you know, more paternal leave so that fathers can participate in child rearing uh, in a more hands-on kind of way um, at a very critical time in children's lives. So we definitely see that other societies, you know, do have these kind of regulations in place and are still very successful. And, and don't have so many of the, the same issues that our society does. Another issue that often comes up, especially like we said, with this kind of discussion of the destruction or you know the the, uh, uh, the deterioration of the family, is the concept of same-sex marriage. Okay, and again, sociology two hundred three marriage and family. We'll discuss this in a lot more detail, uh, but I can definitely run down some of the very important uh, things here. So, marriage which we haven't discussed in great detail here, is, uh, again, a social construction. It's a definition of a society of what it means to make a permanent commitment. So, again, Sociology 203, we talk quite a bit about uh, kind of the marriage premise. What, you know, what is a society uh, attached to this idea of what it means to be married? But in our society, we could definitely talk about the idea that, you know, certainly the idea of being married comes with a lot of uh, legal and social benefits, right? 
Um, so again, you have the ability to file taxes together, which for a lot of people uh, is a very great advantage. You know, being able to file uh, two salaries under a single tax rate is advantageous to filing you know, two separate salaries under two separate tax rates. Uh, we also know that for many people, being married entitles you to uh, you know, a spouse's um, or a partner's um, unemployment benefits, health care benefits. Uh, we definitely know that there's this idea of a right of survivorship, uh, which we sometimes call wills, you know, but uh, sometimes those can be contested. And usually in the situation where there's a marriage, the, uh, the, the marriage partner is usually considered to have Again, the strongest case for survivorship. Um, you know, we just talk about the idea of, um, you know, even just social respect, right? We, we tend to look at marriage as a very important social contract, and those people in society who are married, again, we definitely know marriage has, 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 has changed as, as, as a symbol in our society, but to a large degree, we still put a lot of importance and put a lot of social. Uh, prestige and the idea of being married. So for all these reasons, uh, people who um, identify as, uh, as homosexual or gay uh, have pursued this idea of wanting to be married. So again, the objections usually uh, come from religious or, or value beliefs, uh, especially regarding homosexuality. Uh, arguments have often made you know, that marriage is about procreation. So again, we're talking about children, that in order to be married, one of the conditions or the expectation of having children, of course, we definitely know that the rate of, of child uh, birth in our society, as well as the size of families has been steadily declining for a very long time, with an increased number of people intentionally, uh, you know, who might be described as traditional heterosexual marriages, making the decision to remain childless. So there's definitely a, a, a you know a, a argument against that notion, um, but we definitely know through our, our, our cultures or society's history, uh, non-reproductive marriages have often been you know regarded with a certain amount of skepticism or intolerance. So that still carries over. Um, we definitely know that since the 1960s, our nations have been involved in what we sometimes just generally broadly call culture wars uh, between what we sometimes consider the uh, liberal or progressive left and the uh, conservative right. And, you know, these culture wars often, you know, clash uh, when it comes to topics such as these. Um, another issue that often comes up in our society in relation to modern families is this notion of children having children or, you know, teen births, teen parenthood, um, for better or for worse, we can say our, our society sometimes, you know, uh, and you can say on one hand, you know, demonizes this idea, it's horrible that it happens. Sometimes we look at it as a kind of a, 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 you know, a fascination. You, know, you definitely see shows on TV like Teen Moms and, and all this other kind of stuff. But largely our society says that, you know, children having children is a negative thing and it's destructive to the family. And it's happening more often. And what we really see is that uh, a lot of that social construction that we have about this issue uh, is not backed up at all by research or fact. Um, actually, when we think about this idea, people you know, often hear, you know, oh, there's more and more and more children having children, uh, you know, more and more teen parents. Um, it wasn't really ever considered a social issue until the 1970s when, when people started making argument uh, but actually when you look statistically at our population and the demographics that make it up um, frequency of teen uh, parenthood has been steadily declining since the 1950s uh, US has one of the lowest teen pregnancy rates in the world um, so this idea that this is happening more frequently now uh, is not borne out by the research by the facts um, again, a lot of this comes from what we just talked about when we talked about moral objectivity. Most of this objection to this kind of concept of children having children usually comes from a moral objection to premarital sex. This idea that only people who are engaged in, I'm not going to say 
same-sex marriage, but only people who are engaged in, I'll block it off, marriage should be having children. And again, that's a moral uh, or a value-laden uh, judgment, not necessarily a, a, a social one. Um, and again, that's a social construction, this idea that only married people should be having children. Um, again, a lot of people automatically equate teen pregnancy to unwanted or unplanned pregnancies, okay, where the statistics are 75% of unplanned pregnancies are to women over 20 years old in our society. So this concept of oh, teenagers running around having kids without realizing or just having sex without realizing the consequences of children, and that's why this is occurring, uh, again, isn't borne out uh, by the research that the majority of unplanned or unwanted pregnancies in our society are by legally adult uh, women. Um, and again, this idea that, okay, if you're a child having, a, you know, a, a, you know, if you're a minor or a teenager having a child, that automatically, you know, means you're going to be destitute. That automatically means that you are, you know, uh, going to live in poverty, that you have no support. And again, it's largely unsubstantiated that many, many, many teenagers who develop a pregnancy do have the support of family and friends and other social structures. Mainly, what we see is arguments that are along class or racial lines. Okay, this idea of, you know, we see these. Uh, prejudices either against the lower class or against uh, minority or subordinate groups uh, that play up this kind of idea of children having children. Uh, usually when we portray, again, teen moms and some of these reality shows, uh, it's usually people either of subordinate group or if they are white, they're generally portrayed as being lower class, right? And that if an upper class uh, white uh, teenager becomes pregnant, uh, there's usually not the same amount of stigma attached to it. Um, again, this idea that uh, we believe that um, teen pregnancy occurs disproportionately within the black community, but statistically there are more white teen mothers than there are black teen mothers. Um, and again, the idea that teen mothers, if a teenager becomes uh, pregnant, they're going to forego their education. Right, that, that means, okay, now you can't get the education, which we actually talked about in an earlier module, is the key to upward mobility. Um, statistically, most teens who become pregnant have already made the decision to drop out of school. So they've already made the decision that they're not gonna finish an education and have then planned to become pregnant uh, instead of that. Um, and again, Teen pregnancy, in a lot of cases, is the result of poor education, not preventing you know, an education from occurring. So if a child's going to school where they're not getting a very good education, they probably already made the decision to, to drop out or not continue on with it and then become pregnant. So you could actually say it's the poor education that precedes teen pregnancy, not the other way around. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, another myth is that this idea that you know immediately teen mothers are going to require a lot more public assistance when in reality uh, we know that again there's a, there's a great little inset box in the minor text in this chapter that talks in more detail uh, about uh, the number of people who uh, do not require any kind of additional support okay so in conclusion to this module again i'm going to pick a couple of quotes out uh, from our text, which I think do a great job of summarizing what we've been talking about when we talk about the American family. Um, again, popular constructions of the breakdown of the modern day family are based using idealized impressions of the family of the past. Okay? Um, while family values are often proclaimed in this country to be a first priority when election time rolls around, the United States has fewer policies and programs to support the family than in great many countries around the world. I think the last thing uh, that, uh, that the text does a beautiful job of is displaying is a critical constructionist analysis reveals numerous inconsistencies in the ways that problems of the family are being popularly conceived. Thank you.